Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Port of Bellingham Board of Commissioners meeting for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. I'm going to close the executive session and reconvene the public meeting with roll call. Commissioner Bell? Present. Commissioner Briscoe? Here. And Commissioner Shepard is here as well. I'd like to start by acknowledging we're on traditional territory of the Coast Salish nations, including the Lummi and Nooksack peoples. And I'll start with our upcoming meetings. We've got the Marina, Marina Advisory Committee, or the MAC, meets Tuesday, March 10th, 2020 at 6 p.m. in the Commission Chambers here in Harbor Center Building, 1801 Rotor Avenue in Bellingham. And the March 12th BIAC and TAC meetings noted in tonight's agenda have been canceled. Rescheduling is to be determined per public hearing on reunification of the committees, which aviation staff continue to be um, working on um, and will address at the April 4th meeting. Okay. Do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Yes. All right. Jim Kyle. Uh, Jim Kyle, uh, president of the Working Waterfront Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we would like to go on record as supporting the passage of mortgage rate resolution 1330. Uh, given the fact that our mortgage rates are very competitive, the facilities are good, uh, there's a continuing increase in expenses in running a marina, as in most things. In addition, we do need to be accumulating uh, uh, money for capital expense. We just don't know how much yet. Uh, so this seems like a good short-term solution to a long-term problem. And so that's, uh, we are supporting passage. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak? Seeing none. Okay. We'll move on to our consent agenda, please. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through F. Any questions? Items to pull? I have none. Mr. Bell? Mr. Briscoe? I have none either. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through F. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is yes as well. Passes 3-0. All right, so we'll move on to our presentations. First is uh, SBDC 2019 annual report update. I've got uh, Don Goldberg starting us off. Um, looking for that. Um, hi, Don Goldberg, Director of Economic Development. I want to introduce C.J. Seitz, who's the Executive Director um, for the SBDC for the region. She's going to be giving the Commission an update on uh, 2019 activity. C.J. Seitz, Western Washington University Small Business Development Center. Um, along with our 2019 uh, program outcomes, I'm also going to share a little bit about our future planning and background about the program, but I wanted to kick it off. We have a short video, it's three minutes, that our students put together a little montage of clients that we've been working with this year. Volumes all the way up. The, is there? There's no. Is there? And I'm not hearing any um, audio. It looks like. I know it's odd. Nope. Let's try. To... Okay. The Small Business Development Center has been monumental in the success of our business. Uh, and, and we're talking the full range of every aspect in making my husband and I sit a little bit lighter <laughs> um, and feel a little bit lighter about a gigantic challenge that we were about to go into. They helped me grow my business so that I actually 
outgrew the space that we were in. And then they helped me look to find a space that I was actually able to buy. Whenever we have a major business decision to make, we call CJ our CBA. She's always there to offer technical assistance, moral support, and she also has good ideas for other partners in the community to call for advice. To remain optimistic, hopeful, informed, strategic uh, is my focus, and uh, the Small Business Development Center has been pivotal in being able to, um, to execute our strategies and to continue to grow. I went to the SBDC and worked with Sherry Damon, and she helped me do a business plan that the banks would uh, acknowledge and recognize and see the value in the uh, firehouse. As my business does better the economy, uh, hopefully it impacts the local economy and having a advocate uh, come beside you and give you advice or just be quick to listen is a, truly a blessing and uh, very encouraging. I thoroughly enjoy coming to the SBDC. I come here once every several months and I definitely leave feeling way more confident in how my business is operating than before I came in. Stay open and available year-round to our customers. Uh, without Ash, that wouldn't have been possible. I didn't go to business school to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I wanted to open up my own business doing what I do and to get the support and the backing from the SBDC and from Eric Grimstead at the SBDC was super helpful throughout the whole process. The opening at Prime was just the first step and, and so we've been able to go back and get uh, great markets uh, and, and support about what we're doing, look at what our financials look like uh, in reality compared to what our projections were. Uh, and so it's just been really great to have the support every step of the way. We just wanted to offer a huge thank you to SBDC for giving us a chance to realize our dream, uh, to putting resources in our hands that enabled us to grow our business in a way that we didn't think was quite possible. Thanks, SBDC. Thanks, SBDC. Thank you, SBDC. Thank you, SBDC. Thanks, SBDC. Thanks, SBDC. CJ, will you be able to share that link with us to sure. that video? Sure, I'll make sure it's public, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so RSBDC has been a driving force in the community economic development since 1983. SBDC's drive capacity, we enhance the resilience of our existing businesses, and we protect the legacy of our historical businesses by stewarding rewarding successions. The majority of the work that we do is in growing our and retaining the businesses that we have. About 20% of the work we do is working with startups, helping them start smart, making sure they're well capitalized and have good plans. Uh, all of these services are provided at no cost to the business or the entrepreneur. The SBDC is a federal program of the Small Business Administration, first piloted in 1977. It was put together as a partnership by design. In order to qualify to have a program, you need a host institution, and Western's been proud to serve in that role for uh, over three decades. The program's designed to bring together technical expertise and education to meet the unique needs of our local entrepreneurs. We're also proud to be a part of the state network of small business development centers, and that allows us access to other certified business advisors across the state so we can leverage their expertise. As I mentioned, this was a partnership. So in order to, uh, in, in order to get a federal dollar, we need to invest a local dollar. So every dollar contributed at the local level brings an additional dollar, a federal dollar into our community, thereby doubling our local investment. And we couldn't do this without active car, uh, community partners. They're vital to the success of our center and to the whole entrepreneur community. They provide us insights into the diverse communities that we serve. They also provide to have more capacity. So we work really hard about making sure we're, make, we're all referring well into other programs and that we're not duplicating services, that we're adding capacity to those services. It, we also partner on larger projects so where our clients will allow. We'll bring in other community partners so that we can assemble a team to get the best services as possible. One of the things I like most about this program is the accountability and the um, ethics around the program. 
we're required to have strict confidentiality. We can't talk about individual businesses unless they allow us to. So all of our data is reported um, in aggregate. We're um, not only are we required to have advanced business education, but we go through a certification with the state of Washington. Um, all of our impacts that we report locally to you and to the federal government are required to have written signature by our clients verifying that we materially participated in those impacts. We also get, we also, um, get audited, like tomorrow. We're having a federal audit. <laughs> Um, so this is your team. We have four certified business advisors. Um, Heather is our program administrator, handling the front and the back end of the house. Madeline and Miriam are our graduate assistants for the year, so they turn over every year. These are MBA graduate assistants, and they work on applied research, so looking at primary research at the university and applying that to the clients that we work with. So when I tell people that I'm a business consultant, I get the, uh, like, well, what exactly do you do, they ask all the time. And that is a really hard question for us to answer because our program is built around meeting entrepreneurs where they are. When a client comes in, we'll ask them what does success look like for you, what are you hoping to get out of your business in the next couple of years, um, and that looks different all the time. We also strive to meet clients where they are. Some people are really great practitioners, like maybe maybe the sports um, medicine folks, but they never went to business school, right? And other people are really sophisticated, but they, they might seek another opinion. A lot of our clients are looking to grow right now, and so lo many of our engagements are doing financial modeling around some of the ideas they might have. So when is a good time to buy a piece of equipment or to hire the next person or to go into this new line? And we'll model like, okay, well, if you, how much revenue and is it, do you really have enough capacity? And we'll financially model that for them. We put together um, full bank packages with them and equity pitches. The other thing we do is act as that trusted advisor. So there's clients that have been coming for years and years to the SBDC, and when there's an opportunity or an issue, they'll come and just talk about that with us. We have the privilege of having all this history, so hit the ground running on a lot of the issues. Our core of what we do is that one-on-one -on -one confidential business counseling. We also are doing the applied research with the university and beyond. And this year, we started doing a lot more community education, and I'll talk about that in a bit. These are a few case studies of what work we did this year. This is a jujitsu gym. And uh, these were practitioners that met working at other places. They wanted to come together to start their own gym. We worked with them to help them understand what their partnership might look like together, um, not necessarily legally, but what are their commitments towards each other, working through a draft operating agreement. We uh, did some financial modeling and stress testing, so what if this doesn't really work the way you thought? What if we don't get as many clients? It's working well, they're doing great. Uh, A1 Builders is a residential um, design and construction firm. Uh, a longtime client of the SBDC. <clears throat> the latest work that we did with them was to help them transfer from um, a solo business um, owner into a worker-owned cooperative. And um, that was fun. We were learning a lot along the way. Uh, we helped them look at the opini opinion of value. So did, we, did the buyers agree with the valuation that they, they were getting? We looked at financial forecasting. So what decisions are you going to make different, and what would that look like? Can you service this new debt um, and, and help them obtain that financing? They're super fun. We get to work with them on an ongoing basis. This is Pacific Rim Orthopedic Surgeons, and that's a newer engagement for us and an ongoing relationship looking at growth um, aspirations. Um, they're looking at their partnership and how um, people might come in and out with succession. One of the things that we're working on with them is we're working on their, with their CFO to help translate complicated financial information into management decision-making tools. So why the SBDC? Well, I think we all know that uh, small businesses make up the majority of our jobs in Whatcom County, and they're vital to our economy. And also, there's a, there's a return on investment with the SBDC. So for every dollar in our budget, we're returning 17 in the form of capital investment, our clients' capital investment. So that will look like debt or equity. 
And this is a national study. And um, what they looked at SBDC clients versus non-SBDC clients. So we know the program works. People that work with the SBDC are enjoying more sales growth and job growth than businesses that are not working with SBDCs. So some of the trends we saw in 2019 are continuing, We're still finding a tight labor market. We've all heard about that. We're still seeing good access to traditional financing. We're seeing some signs of slowing, but we're still seeing competitive deals happen. Um, clients are still buying buildings, a lot of business transfers, which I'll talk to a little bit more. We spent some time this year helping clients adjust to that minimum wage increase and where how that's going to work itself out. How, we only have so many levers to pull, so we did a bunch of education around that. So the one-on-one -on -one counseling, this is that number, the number of clients that we engaged on one-on-one -on -one confidential counseling. There's 326 local com companies and over 3,400 hours of support. 42 of our um, clients also did, re we did research projects for them with, those, with the students. So this is a look at the, at the aggregate of the clients that we serve, those counseling clients. So they have sales of uh, over 217 million and supporting nearly 2,500 $2, jobs. Let's give a quick look at the industries that we're serving. Every year when we're doing our planning, we look at the mix in the county, seeing if it mirrors, mirrors what we're doing, if there's any industries that we're not serving. So we, we're, we look at that a lot. This, uh, these are the services that we provided last year. We're seeing um, the financing and capital you can see is also make the start in and when you start up assistance, a lot of the work that we're doing in that capital creation isn't necessarily with startups. Some of it is, but a lot of that work is in uh, growing businesses. I mentioned earlier that community training has been something that's been a priority for us. We've been having a lot more requests for technical training. Um, and so the, what that does for us is it helps us build capacity in the business community, outreach more to, to, to build skills. It also provides pathways into our services. So we, we remain committed to, to seizing as many opportunities, opportunities as we can to provide um, that technical assistance. This is a, a, a look at some of the stuff that we've done this year. We did three trainings all over the county with a minimum wage um, increase. One of the uh, events I enjoy the most is a meet the buyer event. So we work with the procurement and technical assistance center and we bring together public entities that go out for bed with, our, with local companies and just facilitate conversations, facilitate meet and greets in the hopes that, some of the, that we can retain most of that money here in Whatcom County. Um, we've also, we also are available, we, we're writing a lot in journals, and so that's another way for us to increase that capacity and provide pathways. We're also available to comment with journalists are writing articles, so we make ourselves available for that. I think this is my last number. Um, we also count the number of people that call into our center to, to request services that don't become one-on-one -on -one clients. And so those folks might have a question that we can answer on the phone quite quickly or deliver some resources to them. It doesn't, the questions wouldn't necessarily garner a one-on-one, -on -one, hour and a half appointment. Others of those, we're referring into our community to partners that could better serve them for where they are at the time. The impact, total impacts for 2019, so this is uh, 7.3 million, we left the M off that. <laughs> Uh, 241 jobs created or retained. Most of those are job creation because we're enjoying a, a, robust, a robust environment still. And we worked with, we helped start eight businesses. So looking at what's next, um, I think we've all heard about the silver tsunami, the baby boomers retiring. Um, it's been a, a pretty major focus for us. We had over 60 requests for assistance on this topic. So either people looking to buy a business and wanting assistance, 
people wanting to exit. And the other piece in there is those partnership exits and enters that are happening. So we're, we're providing exit services that'll look like evaluation pot potentially. We um, help people grow their businesses to get it to the value they want it to be. A variety of different of different things. And so to that end, what we fear is that enough people, not enough people are planning. Not enough people are looking at that exit. We have, we have way too many people come in, and when we ask them what their timeline looks like, they six months. Wow. <laughs> so ideally, that we would have a little bit better runway for that. We're going to be working, um, we are currently working in our planning stages of um, having a, a larger community response and getting the word out there of the resources that are available to businesses. We're working with um, accountants and law firms and financial advisors and other um, entities like the port to bring together some educational opportunities and help folks understand what it takes to have a good exit and what resources are available. We've been, we're looking at more leadership development work. Uh, we find ourselves having lots of conversation with people that are managing at a higher level that are, their skills are being pushed. And so we're looking at um, building those out a bit more, uh, more partnerships there. Still focusing on expansions and working capital, going strong, building those um, businesses. And we have our rural specialist that's doing really well. So she's focusing on all the small um, cities in the county. She's been with us for two years. And I think she has a bunch of trust built. She uh, has a full caseload, and uh, she's doing a good job. So that is just a glimpse into our program. And uh, my contact information is here. I also have our 2019 annual reports that um, we can, I'll leave with you. If you have some questions or would like to come by and visit the center, I'd be happy to give you a tour. And if we have some times, I can do some questions now. OK, thank you very much. Are there any questions, Commissioner Bell? <laughs> Why didn't you bring Pure Bliss and Kauai chocolate with you? Oh, no, really. Bad call. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have thought of it earlier. It's so good. Me too. <laughs> no, I have no questions. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Briscoe, any questions? I have no questions, but thank you for doing what you do. Mm, thank you. Very it's a nice. pleasure. Very nice. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is on Bellingham Sea Feast 2020 update. Uh, Liz Purdy. You're not Liz. <laughs> OK, good evening. We're here to talk about everyone's favorite weekend on Bellingham's waterfront, everybody's. And uh, I would like to first say thank you, because thanks to uh, most people in this room, we are heading into our fifth year already. So we're going to take a quick look back on 2019, and then we'll talk about what's coming up for 2020. So last year, September 21st and 22nd, some of you may remember one beautiful sunny day, one beautiful rainy day. And we had, um, 2019 was really a stabilizing year for Bellingham Sea Feast. Um, I had worked alongside Deb Granger for about six months as the associate director, and then uh, January 1 took over as executive director in 2019. So leadership transition in 2019. We also had, um, in 2018, a rainy day, which meant, you know, we learned some lessons financially as well about what that meant from a festival standpoint, and we were able to um, have a stabilizing year financially as well. So those were two of our significant focuses throughout the year. Our estimated attendance at the festival was between 10 and 12,000. Uh, because it's a free festival, we will always have an estimate. Um, and we had a few, th that estimate comes from uh, work with our police department, uh, some of our vendors, um, some of our surveys, some of our ticket prices, and that's about how we round out that number. Uh, we did have some ticketed activities throughout the festival, so free general admission with a few ticketed activities, which is an important revenue source for us. Uh, the primary way that people heard about Bellingham Sea Feast was through Facebook this year. Um, we spent about a third of our marketing, I'm sorry, a quarter of our marketing budget on digital marketing, and yet that was the primary way that people heard about us. Um, so that was a change from tw in 2019 that we saw significant results from. 
We're seeing about 25 to 30 percent of our attendees come from outside of Whatcom County, and because the grant was originally a tourism grant that launched the festival, that's an important number that we hope to maintain or grow both this year and in the future. And we're noticing that our largest demographics of who attends the festival are families and retirees. As mentioned, we already talked about what the weather was, which also meant that we had a fully developed rain contingency plan that we did execute in 2019 um, for that Sunday. It meant we were watching uh, the weather extremely closely and had a 48-hour call with our uh, stage and sound vendors so that we could redirect activities accordingly and also share that communication effectively um, so that attendees knew where to go and how our volunteers also knew how to respond. Uh, one of the things we spent a significant amount of time on in 2019 was developing a full incident action plan. Uh, that was a significant partnership with the City of Bellingham Emergency Manager Lynn Sturbins, uh, the Bellingham Police Department. I should have put Bellingham Fire Department on there as well. Um, and of course, the Port of Bellingham. We are incredibly grateful for the expertise lent by all of them. A significant effort to develop that over 30 page plan, which is now being used by the City of Bellingham as an example for the new festivals that are coming on. Um, and has been shared um, accordingly so that it can be, um, can be a resource. Uh, we had five hotel partners in 2019, which again uh, leads back to the roots of the tourism grant uh, with a stay in Bellingham page, which looked like this, feast, fest, and rest in Bellingham. Uh, so we'll continue those partnerships uh, or expand them into 2020, which we're establishing right now with a weekend rate for visitors. Briefly, a review of some of the highlights of our programming throughout the weekend. Uh, Taste the Sea with Hagen Northwest Fresh is uh, a favorite in the boathouse on Saturday, ticketed session for seafood bites and wine pairing. Fishing vessel tours led by none other than Jim Kyle over there who got together a, a group of volunteers and captains who are willing to be on their boats, talk about the industry, share what the different gear types are and really give people a hands-on uh, look at what the commercial fishing industry is. Coast Guard Rescues at Sea demonstration, 1 p.m. on Saturday. They fly over from Port Angeles uh, with the Station Bellingham boat supporting it. You literally cannot pay, or cannot pay attention to anything but that when it's taking place because of its uh, loud and captivating nature. We also had industry tours along our waterfront, our working waterfront. Uh, Bellingham Cold Storage opened their doors uh, via a boat ride from San Juan Cruises. All-American Marine opened their doors, um, rave reviews from every person that came through that tour. Um, and then Bornstein Seafoods also shared a bit of what the processing, uh, seafood processing on the waterfront looks like. And down in downtown on Saturday evening, we had Fisher Poets uh, bringing the maritime culture to life with uh, some fun sea shanties, songs, prose, poetry, and such. Sunday, we had uh, Skill of the Grill, which hopefully uh, you got to experience. Four regional chefs came and cooked up some of the finest Bristol Bay sockeye. Uh, all of them have said they want to come back and do it again. Uh, we had main stage entertainment both days, Sea Feast Wharf vendors over 100 both days, Meet Your Fishermen activities on the Sawtooth Dock, again highlighting the commercial fishing industry, our Field of Fun out in Zuanich Point Park, Brews with a View Beer Garden, which I did see some of you in. None of this would be possible without over 80 community and corporate partners that we have. Um, obviously, the port is the utmost uh, right alongside the city of those partners. And so um, just a general thank you for that because absolutely none of this would exist without it. So um, briefly, uh, all the commissioners and Director Fix and Tiffany and Kyle put in significant time with us as well. Again, lots more partners who we are grateful for. Okay, so we're on the eve, sometimes it feels like, of Bellingham Sea Feast 2020 already, less than six months, I'm sorry, just over six months away, and I know you're counting. Uh, we've just launched our 2020 branding, which you see here. Uh, we, one week ago, put our Facebook event up, and without any effort, we have over 800 people who are interested in attending. That's organic. We have not put any marketing dollars behind that yet. We also have five vendors that have signed up since yesterday. So uh, people seem to know about us now. I will, uh, first, before we talk about the festival, I just want to give a significant thank you and mention of our board of directors who have been putting in some um, pretty good meeting time over kind of our quieter months. 
We are a year-round operation, and what that looks like is all those people in the corner wandering the vendor wharf area to get that many people moving smoothly uh, requires some really specific and coordinated conversations. So we've been spending time with that uh, recently. In January, we had a strategic planning session, se session facilitated um, to help us establish our 2020 SMART goals, just to be clear about what we're aiming for at the festival this year, and also to examine the overall health of the organization since we are um, operational year-round and have an office over in Harbor Mall. Um, and so we've had uh, some great conversation and really uh, generative discussion to establish um, kind of those administrative conversations throughout quarter one. Okay, so our programming here, uh, familiar face there. Um, we are already hearing from Hagen Northwest Fresh, they've committed to taste the sea again. Skill of the grill will return and in fact perhaps be expanded. Uh, we're working with marketing and industry trade groups um, such as Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute and Gen Genuine Alaska Pollock Producers, Positively Ground Fish and Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association to enhance that experience with um, product and to have live demos and programming so that hopefully that can take up actually the bulk of Sunday's programming since we heard such good reviews from it last year. Uh, we've heard industry tours are always a highlight. People love being able to get behind these uh, warehouse walls or the fences on the waterfront and see what it is and the significant impact that this economy has in our community. Um, we hear also that some people have done all of the tours and they want new tours. So we're also looking to find ways that we might be able to um, show the public new places that haven't already been explored. Uh, we are chatting with uh, Scott Ward with a proposal for a, a small inclusion of Fairhaven, not to spread people too far out, but just to include our other neighbor, uh, waterfront neighbors in Fairhaven. I uh, met with uh, Commissioner Shepard in the, uh, December, and there was a brief mention of a Meet Your Commissioner booth, which we are certainly open to having, and <laughs> we can uh, design it however... <laughs> I think Commissioner Briscoe just had a suggestion for a dunk tank, maybe to you know meet I'm in at, budget support gaps. Support it we'll, fully. Uh, Great fundraising opportunity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll continue to incorporate the waterfront district. Obviously, it's evolving. Last year, we were incredibly grateful for the use of it um, for parking. Uh, that was a huge benefit uh, to smooth our logistics and trying to expand our shuttle service and uh, get fewer individual cars in the harbor. Um, so we'll just track uh, the per progress and see what's most appropriate programming-wise to have there in 2020. Um, and then Fisher Poets will be returning. There are several other programming pieces that are brewing um, that I don't think are quite ready for public announcement, but I do think we have a few more new items that will keep people really engaged throughout the weekend. Question, are you going to keep that Taste the Sea in the same location? It seems popular. Didn't it sell out? Is there capacity to make, make a bigger opportunity? It did sell out. Our pre-sales, um, thanks to some of our digital marketing, that was a pre-sale sold out event. Uh, Hagen has committed to it in the same location. Um, I think it's okay to keep it competitive uh, and, and hopefully sell it out again. I think with some of the newer ideas we have, we'll also have some uh, ticketed food options that might help diversify beyond Taste the Sea what Experience, seafood experiences people get to have. But I think Hagen feels, at least their event team, I'm hearing they feel like they've kind of got it dialed in and they want to keep it about the scope that we have it right now. Uh, for marketing, I'll just touch on briefly. We spend about $30,000 in paid advertising for uh, the entire festival. Uh, again, I've mentioned digital marketing here, working with a local uh, firm called Intellitonic. Uh, they are the wizards behind the two ads you see here, which did focus on those pre-sales. So we give them our budget and they make the magic happen with geo-targeting and metrics and all of the um, digital marketing things that we don't understand. Uh, they've also really helped us define our audience, who we're trying to bring into the waterfront um, in terms of like who our partners are and the audiences that they are reaching. Um, and we do have advertising partnerships with Bellingham Whatcom Tourism, which we're incredibly grateful for with some collaborative ads. What that allows us to do is to have a national reach um, in things like Alaska Airlines Beyond Magazine um, and Allegiant Sunseeker Magazine, um, but to really keep our regional focus. 
Again, logistics is just something we're always going to continue to develop and make smoother year to year. Uh, last year, we had a digital map. Uh, it got launched a little later than we had hoped, so we intend to use that again and hopefully have it out much sooner so that people are able to navigate, interact a little bit more with uh, our venue layout. We also expanded our shuttle service last year, but I continue to revisit it and make sure that we do have the capacity to get people to the harbor, um, again, without trying to bring in a lot of individual cars. Um, and we are currently on the hunt for two wonderful interns. We got very lucky in 2019 with both a vendor coordinator and a volunteer coordinator, uh, recent grads from Western, one from the MBA program, who were absolute above and beyond all-star interns. Um, I think that was something we didn't necessarily expect to be able to produce a great internship program, but I think we're well on our way to establishing that. Both said they would come back and both listed us as references and got jobs. Um, so we are also uh, working on our wel welcome booth expansion, you know, really having the right information there when people are walking into the festival grounds, which um, I've decided there needs to be an orientation to the orientation of the harbor because people get confused looking at the map. So we'll just continue to try to provide people with the right information when they come into the festival grounds. Um, and then we do have our golf cart service, which we'll continue um, to kind of have a strong system for. Um, it's a large footprint of a festival, and we want to make sure that people are able to access uh, where they can get to, whether, uh, you know, their ticketed activity at the boathouse or their favorite band is playing at the main stage, make sure we can get people around if they need any additional assistance. Briefly here on the budget, I want to share um, our 2019 numbers with you. Um, our revenue, uh, as mentioned, without our partners, we wouldn't have a festival. That number is 52% uh, from sponsorships. Um, from our grants, that's 28%. And our event revenue is at 19%, which we do know is uh, low. And we would like to see that number grow. Um, so this year, a real focus is uh, trying to diversify and be creative about keeping a free festival, but increasing that number. Uh, national industry average for festivals is around a, a third of the budget is about uh, event revenue. So um, we're looking to get closer to a third of our revenue coming from that. Um, and then for expenses, uh, about just over half of our expenses is the event itself. 22% uh, was marketing, 12% um, was fundraising, and 14% was admin. So moving into 2020, uh, we have a slight increase in numbers for the, for the year. Our sponsorship goal is not small. It's $150,000, um, and that's mostly uh, what I spend my time right now doing, talking to those 80 partners, hearing how, what they liked about the festival, hearing what they want to see at the festival, and fostering new relationships. Um, of that, 15000 is from the Port of Bellingham in cash, which we are incredibly grateful for. Um, that does not show the in-kind contribution, which is also um, about the same amount, so it's honored at the same level as, at the, as the city at 30000 um, Whatcom County Tourism also puts up 9000 in grants. Um, and then we're hoping to increase our revenue to 45000 this year. Um, again, being creative about how we both, we put our vendors' uh, applications up yesterday, and we raised the prices slightly, um, offering our local and returning vendors a, uh, the same price as last year because we, want, we don't want to price anyone out. We want them to come back, but we also know that we're on people's radar and bigger Companies are looking to come in since we spent $30,000 bringing people in and giving them a platform to speak to about 12,000 people. Um, we know that we have valuable real estate at the harbor throughout the weekend. Um, so we're hoping that number is bigger than 45, but a conservative is to say that we want it to be about 45,000. Um, our event costs are around $75,000. Our admin, it's about 20,000. Labor, which includes myself, my part-time program manager, our interns, and our designers, um, that's at 100,000. And then again, our marketing is at 30. So with that, happy to field any questions, hear favorite stories, and mark your calendars, please, for Saturday, September 19th, and Sunday, September 20th, for the fifth annual Bellingham Sea Feast. Great. Any questions, Commissioner Briscoe? Um, yeah, I did hear a rumor that uh, there was a possible uh, going to be a fee for going into this, but then I heard you say it was going to remain free, free admission. The, the, that's a board discussion, and I do not hear anyone. There's not been a formal vote. That's going to happen in two weeks at our board meeting, but I am understanding that no one wants this to be a charged event. Very good, I, and I agree with that. 
And you're doing a great job. Thanks. And Thank if we you. can help more, let us know. Careful. Might find you a job. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got three now, but I can probably make room for the fourth. <laughs> great. Mr. Bell? Um, can you break down that 25 to 30% of outside participation? Do you, did that come from Seattle or Vancouver? Can you? Much broader than that, really. Um, we had reported 15 different states and four different countries on our surveys. So um, I could send you the survey result information, which shows you know what amount is King County, what amount is Lower BC. But I mean, we've got Skagit, San Juan, um, Snohomish. Where was the bulk? Uh, the bulk was Skagit and King, probably, um, but really the the five county northwest area. But I do think that BC. I mean, we have a kind of an un, not untapped. We can just continue to build that I, by quite a bit. I think that, that was kind of where I was going. Did we get much from the north? Do you know? Um, I, I can't tell you the percentage, but I can certainly get it for you. Um, and I do know that really that's where we saw a lot of those Facebook results because we didn't do a lot of print ads in Lower BC. And we were already actually we've looked and we've seen quite a few BC shares throughout as the event's gone on just in the last week. So we know that's a huge area that we want to continue increasing. Okay. Uh, and do you know if that uh, crab costume would fit Commissioner Briscoe? <laughs> I am certain it would. That was my grandson wearing the crab hat. I'd, like I'd actually pay to see that. How much? Just so you know. I think we can arrange that. I don't, I don't negotiate with you. Actually, I'm realizing, um, Commissioner Bell, that one of your uh, talking points previously, I put this on here for you, was that we won. I know. Bronze. That's and not I know good that. Enough. I know. And actually, the funny part of this is that. I was getting to that. This came out right before this year's festival. So if we were bronze, which really counted for 2018's festival, I think we're lining out really well to make the next take it take over higher. There's a campaign. Okay, I think <laughs> when Bellingham Alive's good voting enough. <laughs> goes live. Because I know who got gold it. and silver, and we are far better than that. <laughs> this is our year. Gold and silver? I didn't see the silver. I guess um, like dirty dance. You see or yeah. Someone we're going to beat this year is who got um, it. And then I, I challenge us to get the new mayor and the new county exec into the oyster eating contest. Please. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, I, I would pay to see that as well. Okay. So I'm just wow. racking up the revenue. Keeping a tab here. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, on the vendor side, just a business question. Uh, is it not typical to see a percentage of revenue as a part of a vendor booth? So say a a restaurant coming in that you take a percentage of their gross? So industry-wide, this is kind of debated whether or not the flat rate or a percentage is the way to go. Um, in three weeks, I'm attending the Washington State Festival and Events Association Conference, and everyone has a different opinion on it. Um, if you do a percentage, then you have to have the reporting out and the follow-up, and um, you don't have money in the bank before the festival. So um, the thinking is if you have a bust year, then you don't have a great return versus if you have a flat rate, you've got money in the bank much earlier and it's a secure amount that you can count on going into the festival weekend. Um, so it may be that we're just not ready for that yet. When, when we get to 25,000 participants on an annual basis, then we might be. I think that would be, yeah, one sort of benchmark that we could start to reevaluate at that point. Right now, we did raise our vendor prices. What we did is we took the average menu items and we ran some back of the envelope numbers and we think we still have a really competitive price, especially looking at other festivals. Um, things like Ballard Seafood Festival, which has been around over 30 years and brings in over 30,000 people, which is a great event, um, but we really show the culture, the maritime culture in a way that I think that festival doesn't. And one of our food vendors said they're doing about half at Bellingham Sea Feast that they do in Ballard, which hearing that, from a seasoned vendor was pretty significant. Um, so I think we still have a competitive rate. Um, we want to keep those happy vendors coming coming each year. Um, and then when we reach big benchmark attendance numbers, those that's when our board is having these strategic conversations and we'll start outlining, I think, directions that we want to take around things or, like or that. Or when we start to see national suppliers. So if, you know, if we get an IVARS in there, it's going to be a, a, a entirely different. IVARS? IVARS, yeah. I know, I, I tried, but we'll try again next mm. this year. <laughs> No, otherwise, I'm. this is my favorite festival, and I think we're online to get a gold this year. So, Thank you. Let's go. I think so, too. Great. Well, um, wonderful job. I, too, support it continuing to be a free uh, admission event. I think that's the way we keep driving as many people as are going to be coming and will increase uh, much easier with that pre-admission. So 
think it's already got a good precedent for that. So hopefully we can figure out the ways to make it profitable in other ways. And we're moving forward on that Fisherman's Pavilion, which is going to be a great addition to the waterfront um, rentable space for you guys to use as covered area. Um, so you're able, either able to not have that tent or use that tent in a different way uh, in the future. Wonderful. Yeah, we really look forward to that completion and also just incorporating whatever stage of the story to tell this year as well as it's um, underway. Does does the date line up with um, Western starting? Is that the first weekend Western's in session? I can't, can't Yes, remember. typically it is Western move-in weekend. Um, so that is one of the really beautiful blossoming partnerships is their support to share that information about the festival with their families who are coming in and all of their orientation students who are present. So um, we have a board member that sits on the faculty there, and um, I think that only pr – produces a lot of opportunity and we'll continue to build that partnership. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Any, anything else? Yeah. So it, it, when we have the pavilion done in time here, the cost of renting that tent, can you, what, can you, uh, you yeah, know? that's about $16,000. Okay. So that'd be a big plus. Yeah. Which they could either not spend that money or they could still rent that and then charge a, a premium indoor covered space for certain vendors or certain activities potentially exactly um, we've had quite a lot of ideas of when we have that kind of additional space that's not just for seating and um, covered beer service area um, that there's lots of ideas about how that'll be in a, a revenue source as well so we definitely look forward to it can we get uh, float plane rides uh, if you have a float plane sponsor I should talk to <laughs> Um, and I do, just in case you haven't seen it, I have a couple annual reports and a, a save the date 2020 postcard for you that I can leave. All right. Well, please let us help you uh, market this as well and send it out on our social media channels too. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, next presentation, um, Greg Nickel, Brian Keenan. Uh, shipping Terminal Utility Improvements 2019 Project Update. Good evening, Commissioners. Greg Nichols, Senior Project Engineer. Um, before Brian gives his, his presentation, I just wanted to um, discuss some revisions that we'd like to make to the way that staff communicates with Commission regarding um, both capital improvement projects as well as um, professional service agreements. The way we currently correspond with Commission is in November of every year, as you know, um, the capital budget is established, which establishes specific budgetary line items with specific budget amounts. Um, once those budgets are identified, staff sits down and establishes the project scope and schedule. And then we go out for consultant selection, select a consultant, get a proposal from that consultant, and then bring that, cons uh, that uh, proposal to commission uh, to get authorization for the executive director to execute the contract. The reason that we'd like to, to make some revisions to this is that we're getting uh, input from commission very late in the game. And so we'd like to make some revisions to get your input at uh, more conducive time so that we can incorporate your comments and to um, revise the project as needed to make sure that we're meeting Commission's goals. The other thing that we'd like to do is eliminate some of the delays that are associated with uh, the process of getting Commission approval to execute that contract. Um, looking back at the delegation under the 1106, um, it indicates that commission doesn't actually have to give the executive director approval to execute the contract if it's identified in a specific budgetary line item. And then what I'm talking about right now is with regard to professional services. Things, it's very similar with uh, public works contracts. And I can get you the language. I apologize that it's a, a little bit of a blown up drawing that's uh, kind of fuzzy. Um, so the, the revision we'd like to make is that rather than waiting until, the, until we've gone through the entire process and identified a consultant, we'd like to move that communication up so that once we've identified the scope and schedule, 
um, that we can come to commission and present the project, what our schedule is, and how we intend to proceed. And then following that presentation, we would proceed with um, selection of the consultant, and then we would execute that contract with the executive director's delegated authority. Very similarly for public works contracts, uh, we go through the entire design and bidding process, and then we come to commission and ask for approval to execute the contract. Um, very similarly, there's similar language with regard to public works contracts, and so what we'd like to do is move that communication up into the design process so that we're communicating with commission during the design rather than after we've already gone through the bidding process and executed the contract. Um, there are a number of exceptions to when we would come to commission and request approval to execute a contract. Uh, one, if we run into bid irregularities, say we see a huge deviation between the, 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 the low bid and the next bidder, and we'd like to hear commission input on that. Um, if the project is not sufficiently budgeted and we need to request budget transfers, then we will come to commission and request approval. Uh, any projects that are not identified in a specific budgetary line item, we would come to commission and for approval to execute that contract. And then any other project that either staff or commission would like input on, we would come back to commission for that, that input and approval. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions, Commissioner Briscoe? I'm checking ahead about can't ask. No, no. Um, <laughs> I thought he was coming to me. Uh, yeah, Greg. Um, on the on the last one with commission commissioner input. Um, so, are you going to email us, uh, talk to us on the phone? I mean, or are we waiting until all three of us are sitting here? Because if we do that, then that's going to kind of defeat your purpose. I think. How, um, what, what what was the thinking behind that one? So the thought is that number one, we would be coming to you during the bidding phase. Uh -huh. um, and then secondly, we can include in your weekly updates um, bid results and things of that nature. And if you'd like to have that presented, then we can come to commission at that time to get that input. I'm just going to make myself very clear. I think if I it, in the last one, it's, it's so. I think if a commissioner, any one commissioner, comes to me and says, "I have a serious interest in this project and I want to be kept up to date," we're going to bring it to you and keep you up to date. Yeah, but just so I don't think it, staff has questions for us. The last, the lot of Yeah, any other project the, the staff would like. So the we, wording of that is is not perfect. It, it's really if if you have okay. interest in having input or we have interest in having your input. Right, that's so, the part I was getting to. So yes. we're not going to wait till. No. no. You're just going to give us an email or a call. Okay, that's, right. that's just my thing because that, 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 that makes sense because then we are waiting. Even more. Okay. Any questions? No, my <clears throat> position is pretty clear. You guys should be allowed to do your jobs. We're, we're a commission, not managers. So right. I'm in favor. Thank you. Okay. And with that, I'll turn it over to efficiency. Yeah, I think it speeds up the process for the staff, for sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Brian Keenan, project engineer. Uh, right now, I'll be giving you a brief update on the uh, shipping terminal utility improvements 2019 project. So this this includes two capital projects that we've combined into one. Uh, it's the um, repowering the BST, so specifically the uh, warehouse two berth one, and we're, we're with this bid hoping to extend power improvements over to berth um, three if, if uh, we get a good, a good price on the bid. And uh, the second project is um, extending port fiber out from 625 Cornwall out to Warehouse 2. So in general, the, the scope of work is uh, to replace two overhead spans of utilities. Uh, these are really between uh, the ABCD buildings and the, let's see, Warehouse 2. Um, re relocating those two spans underground and getting rid of the overhead lines. We would raise one span of overhead utilities for improved clearance, and that is located um, uh, one span back from ABCD building to towards uh, Cornwall Avenue. 
repowering the warehouse as I described, um, adding additional power service in the log pond area to make that, that area a little bit more uh, user friendly. Uh, let's see, I described the fiber and communication utilities from 625 Cornwall to Warehouse 2. Adding a few light poles uh, for, for uh, better operation during, during the wee hours. And uh, let's see, new underground improvements for future power services at Warehouse 2 and Berth 3. So to be, to be clear on those last two bullets, we're not installing new equipment. It's just laying the, the underground improvements ready to serve when and if those, those services are needed. So what's, what's, uh, what I like about this, this approach is that it, it gets everything underground now, not in the future. Uh, we've got it permitted to, to get the work done now. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, like I said, we get a good price and, and get it done. So this, this may be a little bit difficult to read here. I apologize for the, the, the size of the text. Um, but uh, in general, you've got orange or yellow. Um, those are existing um, installations. So starting from Cornwall Avenue towards Warehouse 2, if you will, those are overhead utilities. Those will remain. We'll raise one span, as I described. Then uh, heading out towards the log pond area, there is one uh, power service location that uh, I believe the Grand Camp lease utilized. Then we also have um, completed under earlier projects, capital projects, uh, the dashed underground conduits and vaults between uh, ABCD building and warehouse two. The green lines are uh, let's see, grash, or excuse me, dashed green would be new underground conduits and vaults. The solid green is that new overhead service out in the log pond area. And um, extending out to berth one to provide a new service there. In addition, uh, heading from warehouse one towards two and out to berth three. The red line is, is, are the two overhead spans that I described that will be coming down and relocated to underground. Any questions on what we're trying to do here? I, I have some. Okay. A um, couple of questions. Sure. The new service to the log pond area, why are we going with overhead? So this, this is within the footprint of the chloralkali uh, remedial action unit, uh, which, which our environmental department's working, working on uh, the final cleanup uh, remedy. Okay. And so the intent here is that we're not installing new infrastructure that would need to be Okay. Yanked out. So, so when after when we get it cleaned up, it will be underground then. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's the intent. Okay. Another question on uh, our power, our current power to dock for ships to, to hook up to. Do we have enough there now that they don't have to run their generators, or is that where are we at with that? Because I, I was under the assumption we did, but maybe I'm wrong. My uh, Dave could probably speak better to this, but uh, my understanding is is we've had a, a number of different proposals. Um, some. Some are able to work with the power available and others wanted more. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Dave Warder, Marine Terminals Manager. The current power that's out on the dock could service vessels back in the 80s, but any of the newer vessels require much higher power capacity. Right now there's 600 amps uh, out to the pier. We're looking at raising that up to 1,200, uh, which would allow ships then to come in and actually turn off their generators and plug directly into power, which accomplishes some of our uh, our goals for the environmental. Um, What's our timeline on that part of it? Uh, birth one is under this scope, so that we'd re be able to repower birth one. Birth two would have to wait, because uh, we just didn't anticipate we'd be able to, with this budget, be able to expand the power out to all the other births. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions I have, thanks. Okay, great. So uh, maybe in a quick summary here, the project details, as I described, it combines two CIP projects done under one, one contract. Um, the scope is really earthwork, power, fiber, and communication utilities, and some paving. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're working in the footprint. Parts, parts of the work are within the footprint of the chloralkali RAU. And then uh, project schedule, we're out to bid. Right now, we've got bids due coming in on uh, March 12th. Anticipated early start at a March. 
looking to complete all the below grade improvements by the end of April in anticipation of, of operations, forthcoming operations of the shipping terminal. And looking to have the full project completed in late September. And the reason for that, that long time is, so we're advised that there's some long lead items um, in terms of um, the, the power enclosures, the transformer, for example, was a 16, 16 week lead time. <laughs> uh, so we want to give the contractor plenty of time to get the work done in an efficient manner, but really want to front load the underground improvements being done uh, in time for, for operations out there. And then we touched on this a little bit, but the future work, so we, we, we have a plan out there to, to go full underground once the cleanup work is done. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we could repower berth three and warehouse two. Um, those would require just additional equipment from PSE, uh, new service agreements with PSE. Um, and then following the cleanup, we'd relocate overhead to underground. So we, we have these alignments uh, located right now and uh, and the further down the line, we've we've got tie-in locations identified to uh, tie in the downtown waterfront district to um, from PSE standpoint to provide additional uh, capacity and reliability for that built-out condition. So that's that's uh, the future work ahead of us. Any questions on anything else here? Can you go back to the first slide? Yeah. That's oh, there. That one, yeah. Do you have a, just personal information, do you have a feel for what it costs per foot to go underground? It, it varies. Yeah. Uh, it varies quite a bit. Um, so we, we did, you, you'll recall, we did quite a bit of this work on the uh, Granary Avenue and Laurel Street project. Um, we did that in two phases. Um, if I'm going off of memory correctly here, I think it was uh, anywhere from is it fifty or sixty dollars a foot, if my memory's correct, all the way up to eighty, ninety, and above? And what's the cost for the pole? Uh, for the pole? Yeah. Sorry, what? what to go one? to a pole. Versus oh, to go to a pole. Oh, underground versus overhead. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So it's 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 far cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and like and, half. Um, less than that. That's less than that. Yeah. So. Um, the reason there's that, that big spread is that, that first part with Henry Avenue, we were above grade, right? So we're in brand new fill. The second phase, um, we're digging through old GP infrastructure. This one um, with, with the Motka site soils and, and applications. Yes. So it's, it's all over the board, I guess, to answer. I'm a big fan of having underground utilities on a work site. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I got. Okay. And is the main driver on that, are we getting, re are we running, have a possibility of running into those utilities? Are we getting requests from the uh, contractors who are working down there that they're in the way? I don't know that we've, we've struck anything down there, but just uh, the fewer uh, obstacles, the better for, for safety. Um, uh, but not only that, it, it improves, I think, the reliability and certainly the capacity of these. Yeah. these facilities so well being able to provide that shore power is substantial yeah so okay. yeah thank you we're excited thank you very much okay all right well if uh my fellow commissioners agree i think we should break um take a break here and then finish our last um item um after that i think there's two more items right uh condition update and then the mortgage I have the condition update crossed off my oh. schedule. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> it is. I was looking online. All right. Yeah. So maybe we'll take a uh, 10 minute break and then reconvene. Yeah. Thank okay. You.
Okay, we will, uh, ooh, the microphone is echoey and on. Uh, we'll reconvene. I feel like I'm in some cave or echo chamber. Yeah, what's, what's going on with that? Better? That's better, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Bad design. Uh, really? Damn. You have anything to do with it? Uh -huh. I know. I know All right, well, we're on to our action items. Carrie, if you please. Sure. Do we have to do public comment? Approve a 4% increase in, recre it's not till okay. in recreational mortgage rates per resolution 1330 and 1% 1 increase to the active commercial fishing mortgage rates effective April 1st, 2020. Good evening, Commissioners. Alan Birdsall, Manager of Marinas. Um, this item was brought forth to the commission at the last commission meeting. I gave a presentation at that point. Uh, after the uh, presentation and commission discussion, uh, the commission opted to delay action on this action item uh, pending a work study session that was uh, scheduled and done today from 1 to 1.30. I don't have a presentation for you today, as I gave it um, a couple of weeks ago, but just in summary, staff is asking for a 4% increase in recreational mortgage rates per resolution 1330 as approved by the commission in May of 2014 and a 1% increase to the active commercial fishing rates, uh, both those to be effective April 1st of 2020. Uh, the reason for the one-off uh, request for approval of, of Mortgage rates is to allow staff uh, additional time to review and update and revise the uh, mortgage model. Uh, they could capture uh, anticipated cost and lifespan for the inner harbor and potential dredging projects and other capital facility replacements. So with that, um, the commission or the staff still uh, supports and recommends approval of the motion. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, Commissioner Briscoe, comments? Uh, no questions for Al, no, but I'd like to, to make it very clear to, to everyone watching and the folks here that uh, I do not have mortgage in Squalicum or Blaine Marinas. I do not rent a web house at Squalicum or Blaine. I have year-round mortgage in Westport, Washington, so I really have no Con conflicting interest here and I'd, I'd like that to be known so that people don't think however my vote goes it, it's reflected because I'm trying to vote for myself okay okay Commissioner Bell well based on what I heard this afternoon I think the staff report is uh, entirely reasonable so uh, I'm actually in support of the recommendation as it was proposed I'd like to hear your discussions and we'll weigh in as appropriate All right, well, um, we had a work session today and some of the things that came out of it were um, the staff was going to do some more projections on how these um, increases will be spent. I think there was a consensus that everyone knows we have to have enough money to support the operations, we have to have enough money to be able to pay for future um, expenses like the inner harbor replacement. Um, but there was an interest in wanting to make sure that there was a clear connection between what those expenses were, the projection and pathway to get there. And that was part of what was, um, what was not here in this proposal, was that clear pathway. And I think that's what we asked for the uh, staff to work with the MAC committee to be able to uh, really flesh that out, have it go th through that committee that I feel like was set up to be able to perform some of that function. Um, and whereas this one um, didn't come, come through the MAC committee in the same way. Um, my, my other sticking point has been that the, um, the current model projected for a 4% increase for recreational, but it didn't project for any increase for commercial after 2018. And so the 1% came without any agreed upon pathway um, to get it there. And so that was part of part of my uh, complication with it as well. The other pieces that I would like to see staff work on um, 
are thinking about a differentiated rate in Blaine, so we're able to attract um, uh, by financial incentive to uh, fill up those slips in Blaine since we are completely full in Squalicum, but not we are not completely full in Blaine. We have capacity um, to grow revenue by having additional slips filled there. And to make sure that um, we really have that clear pathway for understanding how we're going to get to these large expenses and what additional sources of revenue are going to be needed. I don't think it can all come from rate increases for the users. I just don't, I think the number's too big for what that expense is going to be, and I think it's disproportionate. And so how, how do we bring in other uh, sources of revenue to fill that? So those are a couple of the, the things that I saw from the meeting, some of my interests, um, and I'd be willing to hear anybody else's as well. Any other comments? Go ahead. Go ahead. You have the floor. Well, I have a I have a strong interest in understanding how the uh, fishing industry is going to change, and as as well as commercial, um, ves or, I guess private vessels, because I see the industry taking a dramatic turn both on the private side and on the uh, and on the commercial side. Um, I believe that um, the Uber model and the leasing of boats is probably going to be more for the millennial generation going forward than we have people buying these big yachts and moving them. Um, in here, I think there's going to be a big change in the industry, and I have a big interest in making sure that we are prepared for 20 years down the road and what the industry looks like then. So, from a staff and commission standpoint, um, I I think that uh, we ought to be taking a look at that and, and trying to get as much information around that as we can. As far as the MAC goes, I think we've got enough um, power here, brain power here to to sort that out ourselves. As far as what this 20-year model looks like, we've heard a lot of ideas and. Um, I honestly think we can come up with something going forward. Um, my personal interest is to see that we uh, we do it right and take the time to do it right as a commission. Um, I, I would support going forward with the proposal that we've got and maybe taking the next year to sort out how we how this looks next year, because this would buy us about 12 months worth of time, uh, and it would make sure that we're prepared for the next round to answer all the questions that come forward. So uh, my request would be just that. Let's, let's take the next year and uh, get this sorted out as a commission. I don't think I, the MAC is necessarily the place for it. No, I, and I agree. I think the responsibility is right here at this, this level right here. When I love it when you have that little smile as you say it. <laughs> You're about to hammer something. Uh, in the workshop we had today, I mean, a lot of things really did become clear to me that we really don't know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> or we're going to figure it out. I mean, I think today was the start. I think staff can agree with that. We've got, we've got some direction. We've got some ideas. Um, I'm not comfortable with the percentage split or difference, I should say, here between the recreational and the commercial. I don't, uh, I don't like the four and one. I think that's going to create some. I'm pretty sure it's going to create some hardships between certain people. Um, I don't think that uh, the four and the one if it were voted in today, is going to get us anywhere. I think the number we heard was, what, $5,000 or some, somewhere. Maybe staff could enlighten me on that. I forget what that number was, but it wasn't very much. Um, I'd like to have a clear path forward with a model that we can count on for the next 20 years to get us to the right spot so the, the commissions in the future aren't dealing with the things we're dealing with now. I think there's... Uh, probably many different avenues to to get there, and I think we're gonna we're gonna search those out with staff and with the public. Public input's good. Um, I'm just uncomfortable with 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 the, the the difference in the percentage, and I'm uncomfortable with doing a rate increase period at this time when all the questions I, that I had really haven't been answered. Um, so I'm. Most likely not going to vote in favor of a rate increase. So, because it won't raise enough, you don't want to raise any. I, I, I want to make sure I, I understand. I don't, want, I don't want to create a hardship uh, when we're not really getting anywhere. We're, we're not going to get anywhere with this rate increase on rebuilding this harbor. I mean, everybody knows where, that. Where would the hardship come from? It's going to come personalities. And I've been there. I've been confronted with that. So I know what happens. So you're, you're afraid of what we're going to take in the way of heat? No, no. 
you no, think our, our commercial industry is going to get rhetoric from our recreational industry because percentage difference, this four and one. Okay, I want to get it figured out before we create that. Everybody is, if you want to say so, fairly, fairly happy now. I've been, I've been confronted on the docks, not recently, in past years when things before the model we have now, Rob, came about. I mean, there, there, was, there, was, there was some problems. And I heard today that that didn't happen, and that's not true because it happened to me, and I wasn't the only person it happened to. So I understand we need the money. I understand Rob's frustration with me because I'm not going there. But I have my reasons, and I'm going to stick to them, and I've explained them all. And we had a workshop study today where I explained part of them. And I want to get there before we do any more raising. I want to, I want to get the final answer. We know where we're going. We're kind of rely on what's going to cost, and we got a plan that's going to get us there, and everybody's going to do their fair share. So just to clarify, because the the one, the five thousand dollar number that was just uh, stated is actually the one percent increase on just the fishermen. That right. doesn't include right. the four percent increase on the commercial. So if you don't increase the four percent, it's a very large number. It's not five thousand bucks. It, it's about two hundred and sixty thousand. There you go. Two, that's a quarter of a million dollars. That's a quarter of a million dollars that we won't have to work with. That. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if we would entertain a compromise um, uh, w with a um, rate increase at the 4% as planned in Squalicum Harbor and a 0% increase in Blaine Harbor to get that rate differential and then to um, keep the current plan, which was 0% for commercial. First, first of all, you're not negotiating with Rob. <laughs> it's, it's nice that you're Fair looking. Enough. It's nice that you're looking at Rob, but the compromise is. Going I was to also to, looking at Commissioner Briscoe. You, you've got you've got him you've got him at zero. <laughs> um, I would love. I'll I'll ask Carrie this time. <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> I think it's. <laughs> Um, I would love to look at the differential. I, I think a differential between here and Blaine is warranted because um, I think we need to fill up Blaine. I'm a firm believer that a, a differential between Squalicum and Blaine will result in more mortgage in Blaine and will bring more returns and higher returns back to, to us. Um, so I would entertain a rate um, freeze or a rate drop in Blaine. Um, I don't see where dropping a $5,000 1% on the fishermen buys as much. I think it's more, <laughs> you know, personally, I think it's a political move, and, uh, and I understand that, and, and, I, and I get it. Um, but I think it's, it's sacrificing, <sighs> just on principle alone, I, I don't see the conflict coming the way you do, Bobby. I really don't. And I don't want to. I don't want to lose the 240 because I'm. I'm not a fan of raising the taxes. And if we've got to have revenue for this, I'm either going to have to go down the, the road of raising the taxes on the on the ratepayer to pay for this, or we're going to have to go down the road of funding it through some other source and robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, but I think we're going to have to bring that other source in no matter what. No, not but, this year. But, but we've got a year to figure that out yeah. and to figure out exactly what we're going to fund and how we're going to fund it. And I don't think this is an unreasonable request. Um, so um, I, would, I would entertain um, a differential in Blaine, um, but I do think that we need to, to maintain the 4%. I would love to see the 1% and then do a differential in Blaine somehow. So let's be clear on this, though. Because you're at zero. We're not, we're not in the rears in our operating costs on our marinas. That was clarified today. Okay, this is just money we want to put in the bank for rebuilding the marina. Okay, we already know that we're going to have to go elsewhere to get money. We're not going to get enough, whether it's the 240 now or the 140 or whatever that number is. Okay, so it's obvious that. We're not even sure amongst the three of us when we're talking here whether we should do it or not. Now we're talking about changing. And by the way, commission of year, years ago already did that rate change between Squalicum and Blaine. That was in place for a long time. 
And was it in, when a new Moorage model came along, Rod? Did it disappear, or when did that I change? think it was when Blaine was built. Yes, it's when uh, we rebuilt Blaine that the commission at that point opted to make a parity rate. Opted to bring it back up. So, I mean, and, and it worked, actually, it did work quite well. It, 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 it did work well. So I'm in agreement, and I know we're in agreement with that. I know Rob's in agreement with that, that Blaine should be at a different rate so that we get more activity up there. It only makes sense. I'm still not in agreement with with, with it. Well, and you said something earlier about how the past commission um, really dropped the ball and not preparing us for this moment, right? And I think by not doing this, we're doing the same thing. No. I think we're make, we're exacerbating that hole. I would the hole is going to get bigger. I would disagree because in the workshop study that we started this morning, we talked about this. We have to come up with a plan that takes care of us in the future. This rate increase has nothing to do with that plan that we're going to prepare for the future. It doesn't. It has nothing to do with No, but it, it, stops, it stops the bleeding for a moment, and I think that's important. The bleeding of what? Of, we're, not, we're not in the we're rears. Preparing, we're we're taking, preparing for the future, and, and I'm, a, <laughs> I'm preparing for the next 20 years, right? And I think to not do this is, is irresponsible for what we have going forward. I really do. And, and just like you would say, I am not changing my mind. <laughs> just, just remember, and, and I said it today, just remember, every dollar we take out of, the, of a tenant's pocket that's more in here, as a dollar is going to be placed somewhere in our economy, whether it's on the waterfront or in the city. So there's only so many dollars to go around, and I don't, I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. Too. So you'd lower my rent at my office building so that I had more money to spend in the community? Depending on the circumstances. That's part of making an economy work, too. It's called, you know, that stimulation package. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm prepared to make a proposal that um, basically says let's keep the 4%. Uh, um, I would like to keep the 1%, and then let's look at a uh, uh, maybe a, a lesser differential in Blaine. I don't know what the differential would be, but it would probably have to be maybe a, a 1% or 2% increase for Blaine as opposed to Squalicum. Michael. So, uh, yeah, I would propose that we don't do the, the difference tonight, that we do whatever we're going to do here with this, and the difference come at the next meeting. If we're staff, well, but we can you could, it you could implement, I mean, it would be kind of silly to put an increase into Blaine and then a decrease into Blaine. So I think if you're going to do an increase, Commissioner Shepard might be onto something here where you do it just for Squalicum yeah. uh, at the 4%. And then you're starting to create that differential. Now, we could decide we want a bigger differential later, uh, but you're not going to do another increase. You're going to end up doing a decrease in Blaine. So rather than doing an increase and a decrease, that seems so Commissioner Briscoe and Shepard if we did a 4% for Squalicum and a 1% on commercial and then nothing and nothing for Blaine um, I would love to see that that would be my proposal I'm not comfortable with doing the the increase on commercial since it wasn't part of our plan but I would do the 4% on um, recreational for Squalicum so it would be a 4% recreational for Squalicum, 0% for all commercial fishermen, and 0% for recreational in Blaine. If you had to guess, what would you say we're losing in revenue on Blaine if we go to zero? I did not compute I know uh, that to different marinas, but um, it would probably be, gosh, I want to say 30, 40. Um, the revenues are far greater from Squalicum, so it would be a lesser impact, uh, not increasing lane recreational. Commissioner Shepard? Okay. I have no further comments. No further comments. So uh, s staff will submit a revised motion of a 4% uh, increase in the Squalicum Harbor for recreational fishermen, 0% for all commercial fishermen, and 0% for Blaine uh, recreational. And we can vote on that now. Yes, sir. Just make it? The commission has to make the motion. I make a motion. That's not a <laughs> motion. <laughs> motion that we do the moorage increase at 4% for the Squalicum Harbor. 0% for commercial fishermen and 0% in Blaine. Along with that, the expectation that staff will work with our existing um, uh, organizations and commission to develop a um, formal plan for uh, moving this forward so we have less awkward moments like these. Yes, yes. yes please, and thank you. <laughs> and and I, along with that, I, 
but let's vote and then I'll say my piece. Okay. Carrie's got it. Somebody, Carrie, I have to read yes. that motion again. Can you remember that? Should I read the original or should I read your motion? Be revised. Okay. So I motion to approve a 4% recreational, zero and Blaine, and zero commercial. That would be effective uh, April 1st, 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Briscoe? No. Commissioner Shepard's a yes. Passes two to one. I would love to look at a model um, that took us out of this closed loop system that we're in because it seems to be a non-workable model. And I would love to move to a market base. So let's compare the market based model with a uh, with the closed loop. Let's bring a couple. Let's have staff bring a couple of model examples to the MAC uh, where we can have these discussions and then have the MAC come back and make a, a, a recommendation to the, the commission on that. Is there any desire on the commission to change the structure of the MAC? Ooh, yeah, I think that was spoken to today. That's what I, I heard. I, I, I think we, we might may need to uh, change the structure of the MAC. I, why, why don't we... Uh, yeah, I, I brought up earlier, I, I believe the MAC is insufficiently balanced with uh, commercial fishing uh, votes and representation. So we'll, at our next it. meeting, we'll bring back a recommendation to you for what the MAC should look like. Okay. Uh, and, uh, let me... Yeah, make sure we include a tribal yes. member. Yes, there was also a, a request to have a um, member of the Lummi Nation on, on the committee, and I think that would be a real win. Yep, we'll, we'll yeah, see the, if we can. Yeah, the uh, uh, resolution for MAC does call uh, for representation, and I know we've reached out numerous times uh, to try to find some folks. We would much appreciate having representation on there as well. And uh, and I think with our, uh, our recent agreement, uh, mortgage agreement with the with the nation that they, they should have someone on our Mac representing their interests agreed okay it looks like we're to other business you want to do public comment oh yes and public comment thank you for the reminder uh, is anyone here for public comment we have no one signed up anyone wish to speak is there any public? There's some <laughs> there is. There is. Why do you should, guys leave him alone? You, Jim, come on. He should get an award for public present presentation. Look at the ratio. You guys abandoned this guy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move to uh, other business. Commissioner Briscoe. How come I'm going first? Because oh. I have none. Oh, okay. So that's me, I guess. Uh, yeah, I do have some other things. And, and uh, um. Our agricultural, we talked about the agricultural contact there. I haven't heard anything about that. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, Economic Development is working on putting together a group to bring all the different agricultural associations together. Uh, we've composed a list of what those associations are, and there's quite a few of them. So we're going to convene a meeting of those and uh, to talk to them about ways that we can help, and we'll bring you an update on that as soon as we get that a little closer. Okay. But we are working on that one. Um. Are we, can we, or have we, or can we? I thought I saw them still there. The boat, uh, those, the boats from the burnt boathouse problem mm -hmm. we had. Mm -hmm. That stuff, can we remove that yet, or? I don't, I thought it was gone. Is it gone? It's gone. It's gone. And uh, we, do we have a plan for kind of cleaning up that zone around there? Uh, so, we don't have a plan. There's nothing left. Where, where are you no, I meant, you know, we got we got weeds and stuff and everything growing around. Are we going to kind of... Where are you talking about? What, what? North of the, uh, uh, our Alex's department there, the... The maintenance area? Yeah. North, north of that past the gate where the boats were, all the, we got grass growing up, we got stuff. Unless in the last couple of weeks they've cleaned things up around there. No, but I'll, I'll go take a look and see. Okay. I'll, I'll go out there and take a look. Just sprucing things up a little. Yep, yep. Better eyeball. Um, have we gotten a reply from the train crossing people on the, on the last, you know, uh, whatever type we got to do? We yeah, get, we're doing, last, last we're looking time. really good there. In fact, uh, Harris Avenue is under construction, so the curbs are, were being poured. Uh, in fact, one of the, the members of the public that frequently comments on the train crossing sent me pictures of it, so she's documenting it. Um, and we have recently heard back from BNSF. I think they've, uh, we're still kind of going back and forth on the design for the community boat crossing, but I think they pretty much uh, bought on our design, and uh, their estimates for the work is quite a bit less than we had thought, so some good 
news there. Okay, good. Yeah, we kind of I was kind of curious where we're at because they yep. haven't even gotten back to. No, now they have, and uh, they're moving pretty quickly. So yeah, we're very pleased with the progress we've made in the last couple of weeks with the railroad on all sorts of matters. Okay, good. That's all I have. Okay. Um, my only is a public service announcement to wash your hands. Thank you all, and uh, we're adjourned. And don't touch your face. You don't don't touch your face. I touch my face.